Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using Nidig, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory, governance, and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out Nidig as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Welcome back to the What Is Money Show, guys. I am sitting down today with Mr. George Gammon, a man who is famous for his ability to distill the complexities of macro into an understandable fashion. George, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. After this past weekend, I think I'm more infamous uh, <laughs> than, than famous. I went out with some buddies, uh, some college buddies, and one of them was getting married. Uh, so we had a oh. bachelor party for him on Friday night. So I took him out to dinner and we swung by a strip club for you know, maybe 45 minutes so you could get him up there on stage. You know, the girls can whip him and stuff like that just for some some good fun before we went out after that. So I tweeted about it because I noticed significant inflation because mm. they doubled the price of uh, bottles and now they don't give out the, uh, the the single things. They give out twos only. Well, the and single. You know how you used to go to strip club or whatever. They, they give out singles. Oh, like one dollar bills. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Now they only give out twos. Wow. Interesting. And so, yeah, that was the first <laughs> thing that, that I noticed. So I started to talk about the manager, you know, and of course, all my buddies over there having fun, which was fun, but I was more interested about the inflation component of it. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm like, well, do they have a bathroom guy? He's like, no, 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 they can't get anyone to work. And I'm like, why? Because right. they're getting the stimulus checks from the government. So I was talking to the manager about all this econ stuff. But anyway, <laughs> on, on Twitter, people had a heyday with it. So now I'm, uh, you know, now I'm uh, public enemy number one. <laughs> so you can, uh, well... The Twitter mob will do what it does. So you, yeah. even in a, a setting like that, you're still evaluating the macro situation. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I've just, it's just, that's kind of the way my my brain works. It's just an obsession, you know, it's yeah. a passion. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, it was interesting when I first started my YouTube channel back in 2019, um, I, I didn't think anyone, and this was right on the tail end of that TV show, that I did mm -hmm. in Medellin, Colombia. And uh, I didn't think anyone would want to watch a video on macro, although that's what I was really, really passionate about. I love real estate investing. I mean, mm -hmm. I love it. But if I'm sitting down at dinner, uh, as you know, from meeting me at the Rebel Capitalist Live, you know, whatever we're doing, I'm there talking, you know, about uh, what we talk about on, on these shows and the, the content that we produce. So uh, my point is when I first started doing it, the real estate videos didn't do very well at all. Oh, but really, once yeah. I started talking about macro, those were ironically the ones that really took off. Yeah. And uh, it was a shock to me because I didn't think that anyone in their right mind even though there's 2 billion people on YouTube or whatever, I didn't think anyone would want to watch a video on like the repo market or, yeah. you know, the way that the global monetary system works or anything. And to my surprise, there's a lot of people out there that enjoy that content. Well, you got a gift for it. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that want to demystify what's going on, but yeah. you know, it's wrapped in a lot of jargon, a lot of complexity. I like to tell people it's, if you look at, you know, the central banking slash fiat complex, it's clear as mud and twice as dirty. You know, it's really, really hard yeah. to, to get your head around it. Um, yeah. I, it, it, go I was ahead. just going to ask about the TV show. I didn't know you did a TV show in, in Colombia. I was going to see if you could speak to that a little bit. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I retired in 2012. Mm -hmm. And when I did, that's when I really got involved with real estate investing because uh, uh, Jim Rogers was always my favorite investor Mm -hmm. and his thing is buy low, sell high. So I tried to look around me and find out something that was, or find an asset that was cheap. And 2012, that was real estate. Mm. And so that's when I kind of went all in there. I figured it out. But then um, I made a lot of money as an entrepreneur overseas. Mm. So I never had an issue doing business in uh, Australia or Hong Kong or someplace, uh, even where I didn't speak the language, uh, which I think is kind of a a big block for a lot of Mm. people that I just didn't have. So once I started to understand macro better in 2012, 2013, 2014, um, I felt as though we would have a, a, a decent amount of consumer price inflation. Now, I didn't understand it, at not even close to the degree uh, that I understand it now. But I thought, you know, the CPI number that they're saying, it's, it's, it seems like it's cooked to yeah. me. And uh, if all these baby boomers are retiring and their uh, fixed income or what the, the checks they're receiving from the government are tied to the, CB, the CPI, which is artificially low, then their purchasing power or what they expect their purchasing power to be is going to go down. Mm-hmm. And I think they're going to recognize this and to maintain their the standard of living that they expected in their retirement years, I think they might start moving down south, mm-hmm. to South America. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I, I, I was kind of interested in South America from that standpoint. I bought some property in Ecuador uh, on the coast in some of the, you know, the gringo hotspots. And then in, uh, it was either 2014 or 2015 oil went sub 30. Mm, Uh, and I knew that was cheap. And so I wanted it to, to, to go long oil, but I, I didn't know the first thing about it. And as an entrepreneur, one of the things I learned that I, that I really value, probably one of the most important things I learned is you got to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that I didn't know anything about oil, but then I kind of studied it. I'm like, okay, well, the peso is loosely tied to oil because oil is such a big percentage of their exports. And uh, what I do know is real estate. So if I can buy some real estate denominated in pesos, then essentially that's a way to kind of go long oil. Mm -hmm. And then I can kind of have a double whammy because I'm forced appreciation by buying the asset low. You know, you make your money on the buy side, you remodel it, repurpose it, do something like that. So I felt as though I'd either have a double whammy or if the peso play or oil play didn't work out, I'd I'd kind of have a buffer with the equity build. So uh, I've been investing in real estate since 2015 in Medellin, and it got to a point where we had a pretty significant operation going yeah. uh, down there. Uh, we still do, minus oh, the whole you know craziness with the cerveza sickness and whatnot. But um, so at the beginning of 2019, I you know I saw all these HGTV shows in the United States that that uh, were doing so well, and I thought, well, why on earth wouldn't that be popular down here in South America? And I had never produced a TV show. I didn't know the first thing about it, but I had my assistant set up an appointment with the local uh, TV station called Telemedellin. Okay. And uh, I went down there and I, I pitched them. I don't know how the hell I got the, the meeting with some of the uh, decision makers, but I did. And, uh, and keep in mind, I speak very little Spanish. And I mm. pitched them on this TV show that would star me, my designer, and my, um, and my architect uh, you know, going around and remodeling and selling and buying these these properties, just kind of doing what we were doing. And uh, I would produce it. I'd be the director. I'd be the executive produ- producer, everything. And they looked at me like I was just absolutely out of my mind. You know, you got this gringo <laughs> that barely speaks English that's down here pitching this show. And I, I just told them, they're like, well, what are you going to do about your part? I'm like, I don't know. We'll throw in subtitles or something. We'll figure it out. <laughs> 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 so they kind of like were like, yeah, this guy. But they were nice enough to say, listen, meet us back here in three weeks. Do like a five minute demo reel or some, you know, some yeah. give us your vision. And so within three weeks, I had to figure out how to produce a TV show starting from scratch. So wow. I watched about a thousand hours of reality TV and I kind of reverse engineered it. Uh, not kind of, I did. Uh, so I would I would ask myself why why did they cut 
right here? Why did they move to that camera? Why did they go to this camera? Why did they do this? Yeah. In fact, it's very similar to the same process that I, I use now to try to figure out uh, economics or, right. you know, the report quantitative easing or the Fed's balance sheet, anything like that. And so I, I, I figured it out. Then we put together this five minute demo reel and uh, we took it back to the station. Uh, they absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. They, wow. they greenlit the project right there. So we did 13 episodes of a show. It's called Vida and Remodelacion. So the remodeling life is how that's loosely translated. And um, I had all these, you know, I produced the show myself. So I had to hire all the editors. I had to hire all the camera people. Yeah. I had to do that. And so I had this team of great people that had just got done producing a great TV show, but there was a break between season one and season two. And so I wanted to keep them doing something productive. Yeah. And so I started the YouTube channel and yeah. uh, the YouTube channel just completely exploded. And it got to the point where, you know, we were reaching far more people with the YouTube right. channel than we were reaching with the TV show. So we put that on hold and just kept focusing our energy on, um, on the online YouTube stuff. Wow. Wow. I think we're all glad you did that because now you've definitely broadened your reach going the digital path. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you always been this way? So it sounds like combination of two things. You've got a fierce curiosity. So you're trying to reverse engineer things, figure things out a lot. And then clearly takes a lot of uh, entrepreneurship or an entrepreneurial spirit, at least to go out and do something like you did backing into a, a complex domain, you know, little to nothing about. Have you always been that way? Yeah, I, I have an unjustifiable confidence in my own ability. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know why I'm like that. I just, uh, most people like that TV show is a great example. I, they never even would have thought of something that crazy. <laughs> but for me, it just kind of, uh, it just kind of made sense. The, the one of the, the, uh, the first businesses that I started uh, that actually did really well from a yeah. financial standpoint. Yeah. Uh, I borrowed $400,000. And uh, at the time I had a hundred grand saved up and I needed 500 to start this business. And so this guy I knew, uh, I had made him quite a bit of money in the past. Uh, he said, well, how much do you need to start your venture? We weren't even really talking about the business. He was just asking right. me what I was going to do next because I just got done with the project. And I said, well, I'm probably going to you know, maybe start another business like this, this, and this. He says, oh, okay, well, you need money? I'm like, yeah, probably about 400. He's like, okay, well, uh, I'll give it to you if you pay me 20 grand a month. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, sounds good. And I mean, if, if you think about that, that interest rate, <laughs> that's like, yeah. that's like a payday loan for 400 yeah, grand. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, you know, it was for a specific term and whatnot. But uh, I didn't think, I literally thought about it for four seconds. If that, it right. just, I, I, I knew I could afford to pay him if, if the business worked out, like I yeah. thought it would, yeah. I could afford to pay him the 20 grand a month. And sure enough, I did. And the business was, was really successful where most people, there's absolutely no way they would have taken money on those terms right. if they would have even started that business to, to begin with. But you know, what's interesting, most people would consider, I think that's where the, kind of the secret sauce is for, for an entrepreneur is a lot of times they're taking what other people perceive to be extreme risk. Uh -huh. But in their mind, it's not risky at all right, because right. they have a specific skill set or because they have a specific experience in the past that would lead them to believe that, hey, I got this. Uh, yeah. This is not, you know, there's not a 50-50 a, a chance that this is going to fail or succeed. There's a there's a 95 chance, 95% right. chance because of X, Y, and Z. So the way they, they just see it much differently as far as the risk uh, reward to the average uh, person, I think. Yeah, yeah. The perception of risk, you, you almost have to be inoculated against it a little bit in your mind as an entrepreneur because you do take, you know, very on paper, very substantial risk. Um, is there, 
not, not to put you on the spot, is, has that ever blown up on you, though, the unjustifiable confidence where you really thought you had one in the bag and then it just completely went against you? And it, if so, like, I know failure teaches us a lot. I'm just kind of fishing for a good failure story here where, where you learned a lot oh, yeah. from something. Oh, yeah, wrong. of course. Of course. I've had many failures in my life. And one thing that I had to learn is um, in one area where I failed is uh, it, 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 when I first started investing in South America, because what I didn't learn right off the bat is, and I think this is probably applicable to to your audience, is how much different the mindset needs to be as an investor compared Mm -hmm. to an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. They they are almost the complete opposite Mm -hmm. because the entrepreneur is seeing opportunity in everything or should see opportunity. That's kind of the way, you know, they're hardwired Mm -hmm. where the investor, in my opinion, should see risk Mm -hmm. in everything. It's a completely different uh, starting point. So when I uh, first got into real estate, I did very well in the United States. Then I went down to South America, went down to Ecuador and bought that property that I was, uh, that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I was, I mean, it was out in the middle of nowhere, but it's on this really nice beach, but I was going to build these condos and I was going to do this. And, you know, mind you, I I didn't speak any Spanish at that time. (laughs) And I didn't have a contractor. I didn't, you know, nothing, but I went ahead and bought the property. And then I started to move forward and trying to pre-sell it and do all these things. And it completely just massively flopped. And, um, it uh, it was actually the only uh, real estate deal where I've ever lost money, and mm-hmm. I lost a significant amount of money. Uh, but the two things uh, that taught me several things. Number one, what we were talking about, how you need to have a completely different mindset as an entrepreneur, and uh, another thing it taught me about investing is that. I, I, I like to own things that pay me to own them mm-hmm. because see, this was all raw undeveloped property. Right? You see, if right. I would have gone out there and taken the same amount of capital and uh, purchased an, an already existing home, even if I wanted to sell it, I could sit there and cash flow it. Yeah. I get rent. You know, I don't have a negative carry. I've got a positive carry. And then that puts you in a position to where you're never a forced seller. Right. You see, and and that's, you want to be on the opposite side of that equation. You want to be taking it as a buyer. So yeah, yeah, you want to be taking advantage of a motivated seller. Mm -hmm. And as long as you got that good, positive cash flow coming in from an investment, especially real estate, you're very rarely going to have your, put yourself into a position of, uh, of having to sell to where the buyer has all the leverage. Another thing it taught me too, is the value of liquidity. Because, you know, here in the United States, you're playing a real estate game where even back during 2012, yes, the the, the prices were low, cash flows were ridiculously high, um, but, but you could sell, a, it would take you a while to sell a property, but at a certain price, mm-hmm. there, there was a buyer out there, yeah. it was a very low price, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you had some liquidity uh, after, let's just say 90 days, you know, if you had a low enough price or whatever. But in Ecuador, you could have almost any price and there still might not be liquidity, especially when you've got just land out in the middle of nowhere that's on a gorgeous beach. Yes, it's very popular, but it's not even about your price. Yeah, you know, you could price it at five hundred thousand dollars and drop it all the way to a hundred grand and there's still there's just no buyers. Right. Even though if the right buyer comes along, they'd gladly buy it for five hundred. Yeah. Right. So you, you, you realize the value of, of being able to sell something with, with, uh, you know, in this example, being able to sell something in a month or two months compared to two or three years. Right. And how that really needs to impact your decision making process when you're looking at the overall kind of risk adjusted return or risk reward to the investment. Yeah. So you have to draw this bright line in your portfolio and your mind, I guess, between your liquid and illiquid assets. And really, yeah, I, and I would prefer to have, I I would much prefer, like, let's, again, we'll use real estate here. I would much prefer to have an 8% return with a large degree of liquidity 
than a, a 12% return in very low liquidity. Mm, right. That that was really the the lesson there, you know, yeah. because y- y- you always like to have to, if to have the optionality. Yes. Uh, to go ahead and, and and cash out or pull out the equity or, or do what you want to with it if there's a better opportunity that that, that pops up elsewhere. Yeah. And um, especially on an asset that isn't paying you to own it. Boy, oh boy, you can you can get in a world of hurt if you mm-hmm. got a negative carry on something that you can't sell for two or three years. Right. Makes makes a lot of sense. So if you're the lower the liquidity profile on the asset, it's actually kind of putting time against you in a way because of things that oh, yeah. head south, then you may be the forced seller in that situation. Yeah. My my sister, as an example, uh, another example, owned a vineyard in a, a place in California called Paso Robles. Mm-hmm. And it was a fantastic property, 100 acres. And it wasn't about the value of the property. It was just that that it was it takes you a long time to sell a hundred acre vineyard. You can't yeah. sell them overnight. Right. And uh, she had gotten to the point where she had borrowed against it. And it was kind of a, a compromising position. And I was fortunately, I was able to uh, go up there and help her help her sell it. Mm-hmm. But she inadvertently put herself into a position to where she was a, a motivated seller to where when we were going through the negotiating process and I was helping her with that, you know, I, I was doing my best to make sure that the buyer didn't know <laughs> that mm-hmm. we had right, to sell, right, right, but right. we had to sell. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, we, we still got a really good price. Uh, but that's just uh, an example of of you don't want to be that seller ever. Yes, you know. Absolutely. And if you got a good, if you got good cash flow coming in, if you're being paid to own it, then most of the time you, you're not going to be that seller if you kind of play your cards right. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that um, people often conceive of the market market price as the consensus between buyers and sellers, but it's actually mm-hmm. the most motivated buyer or seller that's driving that mm-hmm. price, and it can get it can deviate substantially under certain circumstances. Um, I like this too, this idea. So you kind of naturally had this entrepreneurial lens, this you're seeing opportunity everywhere, right? But you had to learn to see, see it from the other side, which is to see, uh, you know, opportunity and reward and risk are two sides of the same coin. So as you put on that investor hat, you have to kind of yeah, look right. at the world, do a risk Mm-hmm. Uh, a risk awareness, I guess you might a say. A risk management. Yeah. 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 A risk management standpoint. So that's brilliant. How then how do you apply that thinking to macro? Like, are you trying to look at it through both lenses as you're evaluating the world and investments? Like you, you want to put on the entrepreneurial hat sometimes and then put on the investor hat, or is it purely uh, risk management that you're focused on uh, when you're engaging with macro? Yeah. So when I think about macro, I, I kind of put it into a completely separate bucket. Okay. Sometimes it can spill over into the investment bucket, but usually when I'm doing like a whiteboard video, I, I'm not really trying to figure out how I can use that to, to make money or how I can use that to, to uh, how I can apply that to my portfolio. Like, like, let's look at reverse repo, you know, mm-hmm. what was going on at starting in April, how it went up to at one point in time, almost a trillion dollars a day in overnight repo. A reverse repo, excuse me. If we can just uh, define the- that too, sorry to interrupt, but just real quick, a quick George Gammon, simple definition on reverse repo. Yeah, so it's just the other side of a repo transaction. So if I'm um, a, a bank and you're a, a money manager, a money uh, market fund manager, let's say, uh, you've probably got a lot of cash. You want to put it to work. So I need some liquidity overnight or for a term. They call it term repo. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go ahead and and basically it's technically a sale, but it's really like a collateralized loan. So I'll just yeah. borrow the. Let's say I need a, a hundred million dollars. I'll borrow the $100 million from you, and then I will give you collateral, uh, right. you, whether it's a mortgage-backed security, um, most often a T-bill. Right. Uh, that, that's the best form of collateral in the repo market. Yeah. And so when the, and that's a, a repo and a reverse repo. So from the standpoint of the person who is receiving the, the collateral, it's a reverse repo. Got it. So Second uh, liquidity off the market, right? Versus a repo would be putting liquidity into the market. Is that correct? 
Well, it, that's where it really gets tricky. So if we're, let's, let's think this through because there, it's a, there's a, a big difference between two entities in the private sector doing a repo with one another and yeah. then uh, one entity like a money market fund doing a, a reverse repo with the Fed. Okay. Uh, because we, we've got to look at dollars, and I'm not talking about green pieces of paper. I'm talking about the electron, what most people would assume a dollar, you know, so whatever you have in your checking account or something. Yep. Um, it's either going to be a liability of the commercial banking system, or it's going to be a liability of the Federal Reserve. Mm. So uh, if, if you and I or one of your viewers has an account at Wells Fargo, uh, the, whatever our account balance is, that's a liability of Wells Fargo. Those dollars, that, that's Wells Fargo saying, hey, Robert, I owe you this X amount of right. dollars, right? There, there's, not, there's not that many green pieces of paper sitting right, there. Right, right. And then what happens is you've got some banks, though, like the primary dealer banks that have their checking account, if you will, uh, with the Fed. And that's called a reserve account. So when you talk, when you hear about the Fed doing quantitative easing, what they're doing is they're creating bank reserves. Now these bank reserves are denominated in dollars, but they're not really the same dollars that uh, circulate in the real economy, chasing goods and services. They're the, the the quote unquote dollars, bank reserves that they use to buy, let's say, um, you know, treasuries or mortgage backed securities okay. from the the dealer banks, and that's that's quantitative easing. Okay. So the, the the Fed can create those types of dollars, base money, yep. if you want to look at it that way, but they can't really produce broad money. Mm -hmm. uh, broad money, the dollars that circulate in the real economy that are liabilities of the commercial banking system, um, prior to what we were seeing in 2020, they would the majority of them would usually be created by the commercial banks themselves by issuing a loan. So right. if you go to your local Wells Fargo and say, hey, I need a loan for 500 grand to buy a house, if they give you that loan, they just created $500,000 that did not exist before. Right. Just a uh, liability. That, that's in an, that's all it is. It's just yeah. a liability. And so then what would happen is you would you would, that they would put that five hundred thousand dollars into your account. And then you, let's say the person you were buying the house from was with a different bank, then you would say, Okay, Wells Fargo, I want you to wire that five hundred thousand dollars to the title company or escrow company or whatever. I want to put it into the the seller's account. Well, Wells Fargo would just transfer that dollar liability to let's say bank of america mm -hmm. but they've got to transfer them something else they can't just transfer them a liability mm -hmm. they've got to yeah. transfer them an asset yeah. right so usually what happens especially when both banks have uh, uh reserve accounts is they would transfer them five hundred thousand dollars worth of bank reserves and they, they might not do it with every transaction but what would yeah. happen at the end of the night they would just, okay, how many tra transactions yeah. went back and forth between Wells Fargo and Bank of America? They'd look at the ledger and they'd kind of settle up. Oh, how many bank yeah. reserves do I owe you? How many liabilities should I be giving you? And make sure, right. and all they do is look at the, the electronic ledger. And if every one entity that's involved agrees on it, then it's real. Yeah. Which is which which is really bizarre. And when you really start to get to the weeds of what a, a dollar is. I think Chris Cole says it perfectly that all it is is a thought abstraction. Yeah. And we have all these, and that's what we use to buy groceries, to, to put gas in our vehicle, yeah. um, just to, to pay our rent. They're, they're, they're nothing more than a, a electronic digits. They, they're, mm -hmm. they're really, and, and they're not even that. All it is is it's just numbers on a ledger that the banks all agree on at the end of the night. It's it's very weird, you know. It's, right. it's a, the only reason that that Warren Buffett, let's say he's got a billion dollars in cash, you know, the only reason he's got a billion dollars in cash is because the banking systems ledgers or collectively they agree that he has a billion dollars worth of uh, bank liabilities. So yeah. we kind of yeah. went off on a tangent there, yeah. but it shows you kind of how esoteric and how bizarre. Uh, the financial system really gets when you start peeling back the layers of the onion. But going back to reverse repo, uh, that you've got the it's the same transaction that we were talking about in the private sector with the repo market, but it's the counterparty is the Fed.
Mm -hmm. So they have what they call a SOMA portfolio, which is just basically all the assets on their balance sheet that they've uh, received from doing quantitative easing. We always hear about the Fed's doing QE, $120 billion a month in QE. I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers and listeners have heard that. And that's 80 billion roughly in treasuries, I think, and the rest 40 or something in mortgage backed securities. Okay, well, those go on to the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet, and they create bank reserves liabilities mm -hmm. to, to purchase those. And so then what's happening is the money market funds are saying, okay, Fed, we want to quote unquote, park our cash or our dollars in your reverse repo account uh, because we want to get the five basis points or maybe they just want the collateral. That could be it too. Maybe mm -hmm. they just want the T-bills that the Fed would give them for that overnight transaction. Because remember, it's kind of a, it's a collateralized yeah. loan to a certain yeah. degree. So then you, uh, but where it gets really interesting is when you look at the percentage of uh, entities that are executing these reverse repos with the Fed and see that it's not all uh, money market funds. And some of it uh, are, are dealer banks. And why that's weird is because the Fed in their account, and remember the, the money market funds don't usually have reserve accounts with the Fed, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the banks who do have reserve accounts with the Fed, they pay them something called IOER. Okay. which is interest on excess reserves. That's just basically interest for yep. their checking accounts. And that's 15 basis points. Okay. So it, it, so the fact that some banks are even doing that when they could get 15 basis points when reverse repo is five is kind of a, a, a head scratcher. I initially thought it's because a lot of those primary dealer banks can make a lot more than the 15 basis points by owning the T bills themselves mm -hmm. because they can rehypothecate them. Right. They can turn them into some sort of derivative where they might be able to make, let's say, uh, 80 basis points. Right. So the, the the loss that they have in in you know where they would have made 15, now they're taking three. That's a 12 basis point loss. They more yeah. than make up for it by having the the T bill in and of itself. But I was and that was my impression. But I actually talked to Snyder about it. Jeff Snyder. And he said, no, that's, that, that's not the case because, and I didn't realize this, but uh, the, the, if an entity takes um, a treasure or any asset off the Fed's balance sheet as collateral or for whatever reason, they're not able to rehypothecate it. Hmm. Uh, now, if they, if, if they were if, now going back to the transaction that I talked about between you and I, where it's a pri both parties are private parties in repo, then I could, uh, I, I forgot, let's see, I was borrowing money from you, wasn't I? Right. So then you, that, that treasury, that T-bill that I gave you, let's say we did a term repo for uh, a month, right? Okay. So we agree at a month, we're going to swap back. I'm going to give you cash plus some, and then you're going to give me that treasury back that you've been holding uh, as collateral yeah. to make sure that I pay you back. Well, all you're saying to me is that at the end of 30 days, you're going to give me a treasury. Right. Okay. It doesn't have to be the same treasury, <laughs> Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, yeah. so you can sell that to someone else. You can do, you know, you can turn it into a derivative. You can right. do whatever you want to during the interim. And that's why uh, Snyder always talks about shortage of collateral uh -huh. because people get caught up in the fact that, okay, why on earth would you want a T-bill when you could just have the dollars as bank mm -hmm. reserves? You know, sure, you're getting three per, three basis points. Who cares, right? Why would you want to trade that? And what people don't understand is the the the, the big banks either need those T bills to, to kind of shore up their balance sheet if they've overextended themselves and kind of gotten over their skis. Mm -hmm. Be and so why? Because in the marketplace, the private sector, they would much prefer to have those T bills than to have the bank reserves. Right. The big banks, because they really can't do much with those bank reserves other than just get IOER, which is 15 basis points. Right. Where where they can get a lot more than that um, with those with those T bills, even though they're only paying three right. through the financial engineering process yeah. that we were referring to earlier. So that's why um, you know, Snyder always talks that we got to look at collateral. We got to look at collateral. We've got to look at collateral. We can't just look 
at the Fed's balance sheet, we can't just look at the amount of bank reserves or the quote unquote liquidity mm-hmm. in the system. Uh, that's that's only telling just a very small part of a much bigger story. So my original point there is I find it fascinating to uh, to think about that and just try to figure it out. Just like, you know, you're trying to figure out how to produce a TV show. It's kind of the same thing. You're reverse engineering it saying, <laughs> right. wait a minute, you know, you're drawing it up on the whiteboard and just kind of trying to turn it into a site, just trying to, it's so exciting, just trying to figure stuff out, you know? Right. Um, but now would I, does that really change my investment philosophy? Uh, not really. I, I still just have this kind of 10, 80, 10 portfolio that I call it. And I just like to buy things when they're cheap, some when they're expensive. I like to buy it when there's panic. Uh-huh. I like uh, emotional uh, yeah. people when they're emotionally selling. Um, I, I like capitulation. Uh, and then I like to sell hysteria. And I, that's kind of the way I, I, with my own portfolio, kind of how I set it up. Yeah, but again, you know what's happening with reverse repo? It's more of a really fun thought experiment. Um, I think maybe, but it does spill over though because it kind of gives you probabilities as to the underlying system and how things may look into the future. Mm-hmm. Whether it's uh, with a, a the commercial banking system, whether it's with the government deficit spending. Or maybe it's with a central bank digital currency. Mm. Uh, once you understand the dynamics there, uh, I think you get a much better idea of, as an example, the probabilities that we will have a central bank digital currency in, uh, let's say, five years or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Well, that's uh, definitely a deep and sophisticated way to look at it. And I, so one thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that to your point earlier, all money as a database, effectively, we, it's just a ledger. It's, it's a ledger. It's literally just a piece of paper, you know, and I, I, I had this with me all the time and I did this for one of my videos where I said, listen, this is the feds balance sheet right here. It's all, it's all it is. It's just an electronic version of this this piece of paper and all they do, you know, and I did this and assets, we got our assets and liabilities. Yeah. And then all that happened, because I was talking about the Fed being insolvent right, or, or, or having negative equity, if they somehow, because I was talking about UBI. Uh-huh. So if they did UBI, they would create those bank reserves and then people would be, then they would turn those bank reserves into actual dollars in the real economy. Right. But see, right now they're stuck on the Fed's balance sheet. But if they did that, then those bank reserves could circulate in the real economy as the dollars right. that you and I know. But in order to do that, okay, they're increasing their liabilities. So what's going to be the offsetting asset? And I thought, I, I don't know, you know, maybe a hundred year loan that with zero interest that you don't really have to pay back or something. Mm-hmm. But I thought, I mean, would they even need an asset uh, to match up? Because at the end of the day, it, all it is, is just, it's this. So right. and the, the, the example I used, Robert, is I said, okay, let's say we've got $5,000 on the left in assets and $5,000 on the right in liabilities. Here's the Fed's balance sheet. And let's just say that one day we, uh, Jerome Powell wakes up in the morning and just uh, changes the 5,000 to 4,000. Number one question is, are you even going to know? If he didn't come out and publicly announce that, if it wasn't on Fred or something like that, you know, would you know, would it, would it, would it affect you going down and getting your morning coffee? Would, Mm. would, would see it, would, uh, would the market even know? Would, Would anyone even know? And my answer is probably not because it doesn't, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it's nothing. Their, their balance sheet, all it is, is a bunch of IOUs. Even right. if they have treasuries, all right. that is, is an IOU from the, an electronic IOU from the government. Yeah. You know, what, what, even if they have a mortgage backed security, all that is, is an IOU from someone in the private sector saying mm-hmm. that I'm going to give you IOUs in the future plus IOUs with interest. Right. You see, that, that's all this is. And, yeah. and, th- and that's why I think it's so important. And I try to go over it constantly in my videos that dollars in and of themselves are, are not wealth. They have, n- they have nothing to do with wealth. And I would, and I would, you know, to piss off a lot of people, I would go so far as say even Bitcoin and gold, S- throw silver in there. 
that in and of itself is not wealth. What mm-hmm. wealth is at the end of the day is the abil- a society's ability to produce goods and services, mm-hmm. period, period. That's it. And uh, I, I think, and I'm not saying Bitcoin's bad, or I'm not saying Bitcoin mm-hmm. or gold or silver are bad. You know, I'm, I'm fans of all, all three of those things. But at the end of the day, that, that's what wealth is. It, it, it's, 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 it's not money, believe it or not. Money, in my opinion, is just a, a way to store your excess productivity. Uh-huh. So hopefully we're a society of individuals that are producing more than we consume. Right. And that's how you get wealthy. And and the money, whether it's Bitcoin, gold, or silver, is just a way to store your excess productivity. Right. Unfortunately, right now at the United States, and what we've been doing since (laughs) for a long, long time, you know, going back to the, uh, I was going to say the 70s, but maybe the the 60s, I I need to look at the deficits back then. Well, probably actually going back to Bretton Woods. Mm hmm. Um, you know, we have consumed much more than we produce by design. Uh, and, it, yeah. and at the end of the day, that that is unsa- unsustainable. You yeah. can't, it's just like a, a very simple economy. It's like being a farmer, you yeah. know, going back 500 years or whatever. You, you can't consume more than you produce. You right. have to produce at least as much as you consume or you're going to starve. Right. And, um, you know, like I said, we've been consuming more than we produce for so long, and it's created so many economic distortions uh, that at some point in time are, are, are going to have to be uh, filtered out of the system. And that's what takes us to, you know, Austrian economics mm. with uh, malinvestment and misallocation yes. of resources and whatnot. Yeah, it is. We, we are. Um, it's economic reality. I guess is that maybe the easiest way to put yeah. it. You, this is yeah. like gravity. You can't just consume more than you produce ad infinitum. Like there, there comes a day of reckoning at some point. And it seems like we're closer than ever, you would think. But uh, the central bank has this incredible ability to keep delaying the inevitable, or so it seems. So, well, I, I think, think the government as well, because yeah. I think now we've gone into this weird kind of hybrid system where it's not just the commercial banks that are creating more currency units or more dollars, but it's 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 kind of a tag team effort with mm-hmm. the Fed and with the uh, government deficit spending right. as well. So I think that's one of the reasons. I talked to Steve and Steve Van Meter had a very interesting concept as to why M2 increased so much in 2020 because of mm-hmm. foreign, basically FDI, foreign direct investment. Um, to me, I think it was maybe also had to do with the fact that the government, you know, had a five trillion dollar deficit, and a lot of that was was being purchased by the Fed. So, yeah. uh, and that's another component that's that's I think very important for people to understand, and I think that's something that the MMT people get right. Um, I wouldn't agree with everything they say, but I, I think they nail that. Where if uh, you know if the government is taxing you, they're taking dollars out of the system. Mm -hmm. If they are selling bonds and if the private sector is buying those bonds, they are, they're taking money out of the system. Then what Mm -hmm. they do is they just kind of redistribute it once they go ahead and spend it and, and send out stimmy checks or infrastructure Mm -hmm. spending or whatever they do. But if they're not pulling that money out of the system or that those dollars out of the system to begin with, meaning the feds buying them, uh, then when they spend those dollars, they're, they're, the, the aggregate total is increasing, mm-hmm. right? So usually you have the commercial banking system uh, creating 99% of the, do- of the dollars. Now I think we've got this hybrid system where they're, they, the Fed, is having to rely on the, the government and the politicians to actually agree to create uh, and do enough spending to compensate for the lack of lending that we see in the commercial banking system. Because if you see the ba- the lending in the banking system go down, by very definition, uh, we're having fewer dollars being created. Yeah. So, um, you know, if the commercial banking system would have continued to crank out uh, as many loans as they were when we got that huge spike up in PPP. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, the government would have done what they, they did. Uh, the rate of inflation 
uh, in my opinion, that we would have seen would have been significantly higher mm. than uh, what we even saw over the last uh, year or so. Yeah. So yeah, the punchline for me there, and I think it's an important realization, is that the U.S. dollar is an SQL database maintained by the Fed. It's essentially a network with, you know, if we're looking at it through the Bitcoin lens of having multiple nodes on a network, it's a monetary network with one node. <laughs> it's right? not even the Fed, though. It's not even the Fed. So, so, so domestically, I think there's a good argument mm -hmm. that it is the Fed. But then to layer on even more complexity, the Euro we have dollar. to think about the Euro dollar system. Yeah. And those are all the dollars that are being created outside of the United mm -hmm. States. And this is it goes back to another uh, conversation I had with Snyder, because I was trying to figure out, okay, because in my worldview, it's like, okay, Wells Fargo transfers $1,000 of their liabilities to Bank of America, because I'm yeah. paying you a, a thousand bucks. Well, they have to transfer that asset. So that's a bank reserve that they transfer on the Fed's balance sheet, because they both have accounts. I'm like, okay, well, and I asked Snyder, I'm like, okay, well, what if we got a, a bank in the Cayman Islands or XYZ country, or maybe even a small community bank yeah. that doesn't have an account with the Fed? No and what happens if transfer. Wells Fargo, <laughs> yeah, what happens if Wells Fargo gives them a thousand dollar liability? They have to give them an asset mm -hmm. or else they're going to be insolvent. And although the Fed might be able to go uh, negative equity, a real bank uh, cannot do that. And, and that's when uh, Snyder started talking about basically what we, I think he refers to as ghost money and and ghost ledgers where they're this basically the same transactions, but they're executed without bank reserves. So the Cayman Island, let's say bank um, uh, transfers a, a, a billion dollars to uh, XYZ Bank in Dubai. Right. Uh, for, for, and th so what are they? Tr there, there's they, and let's say they do not have accounts with the Fed because a lot of foreign banks do through mm -hmm. subsidiary subsidiaries. But let's say they don't. All they would do in this case is they would send them the billion dollar liability. But then they, and they also send them a billion dollar assets. You say, well, what? Nothing. Just IOUs, right? IOU, yes. IOU a billion dollars, right. which and is if the new banks, money the into the, the money night, supply. If the, if, yeah, if, if the okay. if the ledgers uh, equal at the end of the night, and if everyone agrees on it with this ghost ledger system mm -hmm. that is in the shadows that no one can really see, other than right. those banks that are in that system. Yeah, the fact that they all agree on it is 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 good enough it's just basically again it goes back to a piece of paper and let's say you and i were merchants and um you know it's just basically me saying hey we've got this uh ledger robert and i'm gonna uh i'm not gonna give you any uh bank reserves or any money or any silver coins or but i'm i owe you a thousand bucks yes and you're like okay cool so we just write it down on our ledger and at the end of the night if we both agree that and everyone else that's in our little community trading fish or whatever we're doing uh -huh. uh, agrees that george owes robert a thousand bucks then we're done right that that's that that's uh, even if i transfer you a liability that would match up with that thousand dollars. That, yeah. That's literally what we're talking about. We're talking about a global ledger that is that has no reserves. It has it basically has no assets other than IOUs. But right. bank reserves in and of themselves are IOUs from from the Fed. Yes. So um, there, that's one reason why you know Snyder really pounds the table when you bring up M two money supply because he's like, listen, even if that's right which he would, I think he would argue it's wrong. I don't want to put words in his mouth, mm -hmm. but he says that you're only looking at a little teeny slice of the dollar pie. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let's say M2 says that there's uh, 20 trillion, right? Well, okay. That that's not counting what's in the shadows. Right. And there have been estimates that in the shadows, there's triple. Yes. Uh, that to the extent where Snyder, I, I have at, uh, talked to him and he has said this on record mm. that uh, the global reserve currency is not the dollar. It's the euro dollar. Ah, interesting. And, 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 yeah. and because there are so many more of those euro dollars circulating yes. and because that system 
impacts the global economy to such a great degree. You know, and, and, and another good example of this and, and something that I was really having a tough time kind of connecting the dots with myself is um, with reverse repo going back to the, I don't want to go into too much detail, but what happens is let's just say there's three main accounts on the Fed's balance sheet as far as their liabilities. They have those reserve accounts that we were talking about. They've got the TGA, which is the Treasury General account. That's mm-hmm. that's a liability. So Janet Yellen's checking account is a liability of the Fed. That's not really a liability of the commercial banking system. And mm-hmm. then we have that reverse repo account. So when uh, a money market fund puts a billion dollars with the Fed, uh, those bank reserves are going from a reserve account that they had at a commercial bank down into reverse repo. Mm-hmm. So I saw that as, okay, well, that's reducing the lending capacity of the banks because they don't have as many uh, reserves to use to back up their loans. And and I thought, okay, well, maybe that's why we saw the 10-year treasury, the yield start to go down. You know, it was going straight up there mm-hmm. for a while. It was reflation, 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 reflation. Mm-hmm. And then we hit April and it just starts to go straight down and it re- and it coincided perfectly with the spike in uh, reverse repo. Right. So I thought that could have something to do with it. But then Snyder's like, no, you're 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 not looking at the the bank reserves. You're looking as you're looking at bank reserves as though there's some sort of constraint to mm-hmm. lending. Mm-hmm. And even without a reserve requirement, and uh, which is, is kind of like a different thing, but they're, they're, the bottom line is you have to realize there is no constraint with bank lending. None. Zero. Right. The, right. There's none. I yeah. mean, even you can bring up Basel this and Basel that. Yeah. And I don't think that's even a constraint because mm-hmm. that ledger system that that only they have and that only they they recognize them yeah. the, the banksters the global banksters that we're talking about with this uh, with this euro dollar system I, I don't I think it's even out of the purview of those types of regulation but what Snyder was saying is listen you're 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 kind of you're connecting some of the dots there but mm-hmm. when you look at the yield going down on the ten year you've got to under and because one of the things that I talked to him I'm like Jeff how the hell can this happen when even you have to, you know, Jeff, I think would be on the side. We put, we could put him in the the disinflation camp. Let's call it, you know, maybe mm-hmm. with Snyder, with maybe with uh, with Brent and um, Dr. Lacey Hunt or something. I'm like Jeff. Even you have to admit that the prices of everything that you've been paying for over the past year has been going up. He's like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. He's like, absolutely. I'll, I'll be the first person to admit. <laughs> I go to the grocery store. I get it. And I'm like, okay, well, then how the hell is the long end of the curve or the 10 year going down? Mm. He says, because you're, you're looking at a, a dollar monetary system as though it's exclusively domestic. Mm. He says, it's not, it's a global monetary system. So if the long end of the curve is going down, that doesn't necessarily tell us that the bond market sees uh disinflationary pressures in the right, united states right, 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 right. it's telling that they see disinflationary pressures across the globe the entire global economy so you could have the united states as some outlier yeah. where we're continuing to see let's say four five six percent uh cpi as measured by the cpi you know that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. bogus but as measured by the CPI, but all, all these other countries are going back down into lockdown and doing all these things mm. that could be deflationary. And, and you're seeing that as one of the cross currents that's being picked up at the long end of the curve, where most of us, myself included, uh, made the mistake of looking at the long end of the curve as though it just it applied to domestic yeah. uh, you know, deflation, disinflation, or inflation. So let me, this... With bill yields dropping, then is this could this also signal demand for additional pristine collateral in the form of treasury? Well, those were the ten-year treasury. Yeah, I might have misspoke there. That was the ten-year treasury. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 yeah. As far as bills, they've been. Uh, right sorry, about, sorry. I, I think I misspoke. The ten-year treasury yields are down, right? Yeah, that's what's yeah, been dropping since so, April. Since my, April. My question there is: Is that could that be a signal for increased demand for? Uh, treasuries as pristine collateral than to go into the euro dollar system. Well, I guess what I'm saying is you you mentioned earlier that the reserves have less optionality than 10 years, 
right? Much so, less. So much, well, there... much than treasuries, especially the T-bills, especially yes. the short end. So I'm talking maturity up to a year. Those right. That's the pristine of the pristine of the pristine yes. collateral. That's what everyone wants as far as that that, that works in uh, or that deals in repo. Right. That's what they want. They want t- they want T bills. Yes. So those short term, you know, that you can let uh, go to a maturity and the longer you hold it, you don't have as much inflation risk. Right. And so my, my question there is, I think typically the yield on the 10-year treasury reflects inflation expectations, but I'm, I'm wondering if the, Euro, the existence of the euro dollar market can actually distort that signal in a way, because individuals want the collateral to go out and borrow in the euro dollar system. It gives them this other optionality that could actually distort the yield away from inflation expectations. Is that something you see? Yeah. And you got a delta. Yeah. And plus then you got to figure, figure the delta between the long end of our curve Mm -hmm. and maybe the long end of the, the the curve in Europe or Japan. And you've got money managers over there that might have some sort of risk parity type of portfolio, like, uh, you know, Dalio uh, employees that that they need bonds and they, they might, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, would prefer a U.S. bond, even though uh, the, the stuff, that you're buying at the grocery store is going up in price. The stuff that they're buying in Tokyo isn't going up in price. Right. And then you've got some currency risk, some hedging. There, there are so many cross currents. Uh, another thing too that um, that uh, could be at, at play there is um, you'll notice this kind of shift happen right when we started to get some, um, uh, let's say disagreement, for lack of a better word, with the politicians on what they're doing next with the the, the stimulus. You know, we, I think stimulus is exactly like quantitative easing. The fact that it needs to continue to get larger and larger and larger yeah. because now we're kind of building our economy around this stimulus. Mm-hmm. Well, if that starts to, if uh, it's Gunlock said it perfect, he's like, if stimulus is transitory then inflation is definitely going to be transitory. It's mm-hmm. all about stimulus. Right. So if the bond market sees uh, them not agreeing, the politicians, you know, because they understand that a lot of those dollars are being created by the politicians now, not necessarily the commercial banking system, then they could be buying those. And then also, too, they see the mortgage forbearance. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially ending, they see the the eviction. What is it? The um, the rent eviction. Uh, potentially coming to an end. They see all of the, the 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 stimmy checks, you know, that have gone out. Now I think there's some more, but they see this potentially coming to an end. And if you're a hedge fund manager, you're like, wait a minute here. Everyone is on the the reinflation side of the boat. I'm going to go in there and take a a bet on the 10 year going back down in yield, meaning price going up. Yeah. So I think everyone's on one side of the boat. And and although I know my groceries are going up and there is inflation yeah, yeah, yeah. in the system, I don't care because I'm not holding on to this 10-year treasury to get the 1.5% right. yield. I'm buying it for, as, for a capital gain. Right. You so, see, and then you that creates additional demand. And then you've yeah. got the Fed buying too, yes. that would create additional demand. What's bizarre about the Fed buying and the additional demand is the fact that every single time they've done QE, uh, prices go down, not up. Right. And and yields go up, which is completely counterintuitive because you would think that if the Fed came out and started buying all of these treasuries, you know, all these 10-year treasuries, let's say, well, the Fed buying would create additional right. demand. And if there's right. additional demand, then you would think the price would go up. Yeah. But if you look at QE one, two, three, and even what we saw in 2020, uh, when the Fed starts QE, interest rates actually go up, mm. not down. It, and, it, and what's ironic about that is even the Bank of England has come out and explicitly said uh, with a, a YouTube video, by the way, uh, that the intention of quantitative easing is to get interest rates in the real economy, i.e. the 10 year, mm-hmm. uh, to go down. And we right. see that every single time the Fed's tried it through QE, it, it's gone the opposite direction. So it, that that furthers the, the point that the Fed, although a lot of the market participants would like to think that they've got control over this situation, yeah. uh, it, nothing could be further from the truth. So the derivative dollar system we call the euro dollar system has just grown 
uh, well in excess of the Fed's balance sheet. No one, and by the way, to your point earlier, no one knows how big this thing is, right? It's just opaque. Uh, it's a lot of private deals that just expand the money supply outside the purview of the Fed. And then, yeah, and what what really too would I think would blow the mind of your your viewers? It, it, this blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Is is we've all heard of rehypothecation, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't realize that there'd actually been some studies done on it. And Snyder was telling me about this, where they've they've actually got a name for it. They call it a collateral multiplier. <laughs> so I, I, I so collateral meaning T bills or treasures yeah, yeah, or even yeah, mortgage yeah. backed securities, you know, to where they've they've gone in and studied it and say, okay, on average, how many times is this collateral rehypothecated, right. meaning sold or used in a, another capacity other than the person who actually yeah. owns it, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And they thought that it was I, I forgot they they said somewhere like maybe four or five times. And wow. I was like, wow, that that's is that's crazy. Yeah, he said that's wow. the average, but he says, but he said in in his opinion, and other well, there's very few people that know as much as Jeff about you know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But he said, in his opinion, it's not even close to four or five. I was blown away by four or five. You know, that'd be higher. maybe two or three. Yeah. He said it was 30. Wow. 30. He says, so the collateral multiplier is 30. So he says, not only do you need, and this was a real aha moment for me as well, because we think about the supply and demand dynamics that we were talking about earlier, right? Mm. With the, 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 the Fed buying, creating more demand, and then uh, Janet Yellen basically, uh, and then the politicians creating the supply of new treasuries at yeah. auction when they're when they're deficit spending right but that's that's even that's not the whole picture in fact that's probably just a small slice of the pie from the standpoint of what would or what could potentially have a much larger impact on the amount of collateral or treasuries that are available in the system is the collateral multiplier right right so let's say right. that Janet Yellen came out and issued a hundred billion worth of uh let's say there let's say Jerome Powell which he kind of admitted to the other day recognized that there was an issue with there not being enough T bills in the system or the market was basically saying hey we need more T bills mm -hmm. um and so i i asked Jeff i said well couldn't we just have this you you would think logically that Janet Yellen could come out and the next time they do a 6 trillion dollars uh, stimulus package or whatever just issue all T bills you know, why do you got to, why do you have to issue 10 year, just issue all T bills, what the market wants. And, and then we started kind of going through this thought experiment together. And I'm like, well, wait a minute though, but that might not even work because if the collateral multiplier with that's based on counterparty risk that the right. dealers see, right. right. That are rehypothecating yeah. the treasure in the first place. If that is decreasing, let's say it goes from 30 all the way down to 15. Well, that's going to create a lot fewer treasuries in aggregate total, even if Yellen is out there, uh, you know, auctioning off a hundred billion worth of T bills that day. Right. It's so so the 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 power, and this is really kind of the whole point here, is is the power uh, in who controls the dollar really isn't. It's not even close to the Fed. Yeah. Not even close to the Fed. And when I'm talking about dollar, I'm talking about the dollars that are circulating yeah. in the real economy, domestic economy, and global economy, right. chasing goods and services. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, they don't control it. And, and, and to a large degree, Janet Yellen doesn't control it. The politicians don't control it. What really controls it are, are these are the banksters yeah. and these primary dealer banks. Uh, but then, you know, what, what controls that? is their ability to lend productively and actually get a return. And that's where for me, it all goes back to counterparty risk. Right. Because if those dealers are see a significant amount of counterparty risk in the system, then that collateral multiplier most likely is going to go down. And therefore we're going to see these cracks in the system with repo. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one thing, you know, the, the, the mainstream narrative out there when repo went from in, in basically, not basically, it went from $0 a night, $0 a night. Mm -hmm. Like go back to look at a chart back, I believe in maybe 
if you go back to February or January, there was literally zero dollars a night in reverse repo with the mm-hmm. Fed as a counterparty. Mm-hmm. So how on earth, if this was a, a problem of just excess liquidity in the system, how do we go within the matter of like, I don't know what it was exactly, but it's like like three or four days. How in three or four days, how do we go from you know basically zero up to a trillion or mm-hmm. up to 700 billion? Mm-hmm. If it was just uh, if it was just a, a liquidity issue, did right. we just have one dollar that, that that just that was the straw that broke the camel's back? You know, mm-hmm. of course mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. It's nonsense. Yeah. So that's why for me it, it kind of lends it, it lends itself to the idea that the probability is is that there was some sort of counterparty risk issue in the system where the money market fund managers knew about it and like we don't want anything to do with it so if we're going to choose a counterparty do we want a commercial bank a hedge fund xyz as our counterparty or do we want the fed knowing that they can just create the the bank reserves or those types of dollars yeah that at the end of the day they they would make us whole and we're still getting those treasuries as as collateral you know it, it makes you kind of wonder okay what's going on here but i think what we can safely conclude is that it's it the, the mainstream narrative is wrong it, right. it is when, when you see reverse repo go to a, a trillion it is not because there's excess uh, uh liquidity it's either uh, th- th- that's maybe a component of it but that's yeah. not the whole story right, at all right the, the the bigger story there is either collateral and or uh, counterparty risk that's in the shadows that we can't see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So try to pull this back a little bit. So gold and treasuries function essentially as base money for um, for this money pyramid we're describing, which is something I talked about at your event, right? And it seems like this collateral multiplier then is actually injecting counterparty risk into that base money. Like typically U.S. Treasury, the only counterparty risk there is the government itself. Hmm. But by multiplying this collateral or re-lending it, re-hypothecating it, re-borrowing it on the other side of the the trade, you're actually uh, expanding the base layer money by fiat. Effectively, yeah, Robert. You know the best way to think about it? It's fractional reserve collateral. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. So, yeah. And then this this <laughs> this reverse repo situation you're saying is I the way I'm seeing this is that the this is clearly injecting additional hidden risk into the economy. We're talking about putting counterparty risk, or, into or it could money. it could be a result. It could be the um, I don't know that it in and of itself is creating more risk, but I, I think it could be kind of the canary in the coal mine, or it could be, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire type. Thing. Yes. So, yeah. So market actors are sniffing this out then and desiring the best counterparty available. So they're going mm. to the central bank, right. To, to reduce their own counterparty risk as general counterparty risk accumulate in the system. Is that what's happening yeah. here? Well, it it could be. That's kind of my hypothesis. Okay. And there's just no way of knowing definitively. Yeah. yeah. But but that's what makes the most sense to me. Yeah. When, when you think through everything that's happening, uh, would just to say that it's a liquidity issue is very. Um, th- that that's kind of a. I don't want to say it's a lazy way to think about it, but but it really is. It's, it's not looking it's at the not, collateral situation. You're you're not looking at the bigger picture. You're you're yeah. just looking at this little teeny piece of it, which really. I don't think is is very significant at all yes. because if you really understand it, you realize that bank reserves in and of themselves aren't really significant at all uh, right. when you think about that ghost money and that ghost ledger system. I think the big takeaway I'm, I'm getting here is that we've just unmoored ourselves from the economic reality we're talking about, where it's yeah, yeah, you know, it's reapothecation, yeah. and uh, this goes back to Milton Friedman where he talked about the bookkeeper's pen. Right, that's yeah, what was that's facilitating right. all of this, and we've just taken that's that right. to the to the extreme. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier too. Where you said wealth is the capacity of an economy to produce goods and services or produce capital. Um, I would maybe caveat that a bit to say it's also that capital that's already been produced. Right, so the capital stock that exists in the world that money lays claim to—that's what a lot of um, this is about 
in my opinion. And I like the way you framed gold. I'm sorry, you, you said money as a way of storing that excess productivity, which yeah. is a really good way to look at it because that's exactly what gold was historically. It's like if you yep. could not expend your labor doing something more productive, you would go mine gold and that would basically be a battery for this excess productivity. Or you would hold gold. You know, if you had, uh, yes. if you if you raised a hundred cattle and you could only use 50 of them, then you'd sell the other 50. Right. And then you'd sell them for, for gold. And that gold would be your, your excess productivity that you would store. Yes. And the bank was established as the institution to guard and transact mm -hmm. that excess liquidity. But now we're in this situation where you use this term negative equity institution, which I think is very important. That's the Fed is just digging its digging a hole for itself, right? Is it just increasingly insolvent, and it's just externalizing well, those costs via printing more money? I mean, yeah, I, I don't I don't know that they're technically insolvent. Uh, my I, what I was trying to think through is could they be, or mm. in the, like would it even matter if, if right. they were? Um, I I don't really think it would, but uh, you know who knows? I mean, right now, if you yeah, their assets match up with their uh, liabilities. Yeah, but if if one day they just uh, didn't have any assets, would it prevent them from creating more liabilities? Would would they go bust? Would they right. could they go out of business? Um, I I don't think so, especially when they don't produce anything. I mean, you got it. People have to think about that. They, the Fed doesn't produce anything. The only right. thing you always say, well, it produces bank reserves. But what's a bank reserve? Right. All it is is an entry on the, the ledger. Spend, yeah. That, so that's th right. That that's all it is. And then you know, I was having a um, a, a discussion. But, uh, I don't. Well, yeah, you know, you met Hartman and uh, and Kenny McElroy at my event. Yes, I did. And uh, yeah, we well, you know this. We started a mastermind. You were at dinner with us there with, when we had the drinks and everything. Um, and and we had our first uh, Zoom meeting with the the, the group, the found the, the founders of the group mm -hmm. there, about twenty five people. And these were all very successful entrepreneurs, you know, that had started a business, had grown this business, mm -hmm. and uh, they had done very well for themselves. And and one thing that I was saying this this and this really is one of my pet peeves is is when the uh, politicians, you know, come out and saying that oh we're, we're doing this stimulus uh, package and we're going to create a million jobs right. or we're going to create this or we're going to do that. No, you're not. not no, you're not. Anything. You're not doing anything. Yeah. All you're doing is sitting there just playing golf or, or yeah. whatever. The entrepreneurs, that's right. Uh, the individuals that are out there creating the goods and services, taking the risk with yes. capital, they're the ones that are doing that. And I think, you know, going back to your earlier point where you're talking about the wealth in society be, being the uh, ability to create goods and services, but that in and of itself is very, uh, not completely, but very dependent upon the system in which you're dealing with. So you look at countries that have built wealth and become wealthy and increase their standard of living significantly. Well, what is it? You know, oh, okay, you got private property rights. Yes. You got rule of law. Mm -hmm. You've got sound money. Mm -hmm. And usually you've got reasonably low taxes. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. You know, you put those four things together. And just let human beings pursue their That's own right. self-interest. And magically, over time, you're going to have a society that creates a lot of, st a lot of stuff. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, uh, you know, one of the conversations that you and I have had uh, extensively is it creates stuff more efficiently and cheaper. Yes. Constantly cheaper, 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 cheaper. Yes. And then the people, you know, the, the, the deflation people, they say, oh, that's terrible. We don't want deflation because, but they don't realize that there's two completely different components to, or two, two types of, of deflation. One type of deflation decreases demand. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of deflation we would have now because our whole system is built on debt and right. it's built on consumption, it not productivity. Demand. Yep. That's right. But in, in good deflation, what we'd have was sound money mm -hmm. that would create an environment where lower prices would create more and more and more demand. That's right. You know, is there more demand now for cell phones at when, when you can buy this iPhone for 500 bucks or whatever? Right. Or was there more demand for cell phones when they were $5,000? 
right? Exactly. It's Of course, there's way more demand now because the price has come down and it benefits society at large. That's what would be happening with absolutely everything in our economy if we truly did have a free market. And that's why I always, whenever people say the word capitalism, I always like to, to I don't want to, you know, I don't correct them, but in, in my mind, I always try to make sure that whenever I'm using the word capitalism, I'm not just saying capitalism because that in and of itself doesn't make the difference. It's free market yes. capitalism. Right. That is the key. Free market capitalism where we allow banks to fail. Yes. We, we don't, we, there are no bailouts. We don't create moral hazard. We, we allow the free market to work. And, uh, you know, that's what, especially now in 2021, we have gone so far yes. away from that. And, you know, another good example of that, Robert, you know, I, I, I'm guessing that you've probably experienced this in your own life and a lot of your viewers have. But I always tell the story that, um, you know, my portfolio now is significantly larger than it was in 2019. Uh, because I, I was fortunate to, to buy the panic back in um, in March of 2020 with a lot of commodities and whatnot. Um, but I, I I look at the portfolio and I'm like, okay, well, that's nice. Uh, it, it's bigger. But I would consider myself today much poorer mm. than I was in 2019, mm. although my net worth is significantly larger. Your nominal net that? worth. Yeah. Be, why is that? Because I have access to fewer goods and services. Right. That's why. Right. Because but now it takes me an hour to get an Uber. Yes. Where before I could get one in five minutes. You see, that's access yes. to goods and services. Yeah. The, well, let's go back to what we, uh, you know, what, what people are gonna get pissed off at me and yell at me on Twitter for. <laughs> let's go back to the last Friday night when I was out with my buddy for his bachelor party for a little bit. There was no attendant in the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, that may sound funny, but hey, that's that that's a, a service that would that's have been right. there in 2019. You know? That's right. So if you think about your own life, I would challenge everyone listening or watching this video right now to think about the services and goods that you had access to mm -hmm. in uh, 2019 compared to what you have today. And whether it's waiting in line for two hours mm -hmm. at, a, at, a, at a restaurant where normally you could have just walked right in. I mean, you see it everywhere. Yep. And that's why I would argue that regardless of the size of someone's portfolio or their net worth, yes. I would argue that they are actually poorer today than they were in uh, 2019. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's this concept of state capitalism is all we have in the world today. And for the people listening on audio, you're wearing a hat right now. It says hashtag in the fed. I yeah. mean, that is, <laughs> that is the core that prevents the market from actually being free market capitalism is that we don't let banks, one of them, one of them. But I would say if you ripped that out, if you ripped out the monopoly on money, a lot of the other problems would resolve themselves. Yeah, I that's think. true. That's true. Yeah. Um, because the government would be much smaller. Exactly. So government would shrink. Uh, intervention and regulation would recede. And it's this intervention, this government intervention that's creating these distortions in the market. So mm. they're sending people checks. They have no incentive to go to work, whether it's as a bathroom attendant or some other um, position. <laughs> this creates shortages, governments. And we've seen this history play out time and time again, where then governments try to respond to the economic distortions they are creating with more legislation and regulation. So if there's a shortage yeah, right. for a particular good, they'll insert price controls. This distorts mm. it even further. So is that, are we going down that road right now? Are we just going to repeat what we've seen multiple civilizations go through? It's like, and, and Misa said it well, it's like, once you start distorting the money, you have one of two outcomes. It's very binary. You either have deflationary crash back to economic yeah, reality, right. or right. you have the crack up boom, which is hyperinflation. The currency system implodes at some point. Yeah. yeah. Are we going down that path right now? And if so, I, where are we? Absolutely. And I think Chris Cole's work would confirm that. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Chris Cole. Uh, he's going to be at the next actual uh, Rebel Capital slide. But most people would know him from his dragon portfolio mm -hmm. uh, and his paper called The Allegory of the Hawk and Serpent, mm -hmm. uh, which is free on his website, Artemis Capital. I, I'd strongly suggest it. But he goes back 100 years 
and he shows that uh, you, you know he has all these kind of symbols for it. But it, it, the bottom line is once you get the debt to the levels that we have today, mm-hmm. not only with the consumer balance sheet, but the corporate balance sheet and the sovereign balance sheet, you, you've got one of two options. You either have, you have to have a deleveraging. That's the yep. point. Right. And you either have an inflationary deleveraging mm-hmm. or you have to have a deflationary right. deleveraging. And, um, you know, the question is, is which one do we get? Now, I think the probabilities are highest that we would have and that we will have an inflationary deleveraging um, because I think the system is going to change. Mm-hmm. So whenever people ask me, say, George, do you think we're going to have inflation or deflation or disinflation or whatever? I, I always try to, 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 Say well, you know that depends on what the system looks like. Yeah, or look at what the system looks like. Excuse me, if the system looks like what we have had for decades, where the commercial banking system and the euro dollar system was responsible for creating the majority of dollars, then personally, I would be in the deflation camp. Uh, now, I, I don't know that we would see significant price. Uh, consumer price deflation. Um, I, I think that would still continue to kind of flat or kind of trend up. But I think at, we would have huge asset price mm-hmm. deflation. Then, but but if you say, okay, well, the system looks like it is right now, where the commercial banks are lending less, but the government is just this massive deficit machine, you know, that's being monetized by the Fed. In that case, I think we kind of stair step it. Uh, you know, you, you get these, it depends on the government spending, you know, you get these bursts of inflation when the government is spending and, oh, by the way, they're restricting supply mm-hmm. to your earlier point, mm-hmm. you know, paying people. Mm-hmm. When's the last time you went to a, a store, any store and did not see a help wanted sign? Right. Right. That means we're producing less goods and services, yeah. but we're creating more currency units. Yes. So what, what's going to happen? Of course, you're going to get that of labor. spike. Mm-hmm. That's right. You're going to get a, a short of, of everything, for, yeah. uh, but you're going to get that spike in inflation. But then once the government stops spending, then the dollars stop flowing. Then you start to see the disinflationary pressures because left to its own devices, I think the economy would deflate. Yes. I think we would have a deflationary deleveraging. Yeah. And that's you look at M2 money supply. Same thing. Yeah. We're going back to repo in April and the treasury yields. In, in April, look at M2, it flattened out as well, mm-hmm. starts to flatten out. So it's it's just kind of this, we're all dependent or inflation, disinflation is dependent on this weird government hybrid system. Yeah. Now, I think the um, central banks know this to a certain degree. I mean, my goodness, they've had all of Japan to study. Yeah. You know, they've had the European Union to study. They've had negative interest rates to study. They, uh, if they don't get it now, I mean, there's absolutely no hope for them. Mm-hmm. But, and I, but I do think they realize that they don't control the dollar. And I think that's why you will always see the banks being bailed out. Yeah. That's why I think back in 2008, they came in. I know we had Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and whatnot, but outside of that, they came in and they bailed out every single bank, AIG, you know, bam, bam, the bank, bailout, bailout, right. bailout, 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 because they realize that the Fed is not in control of dollars, it's the banks. And if yeah. the banks all go bust, you got big, 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 right. big problems. But they realize that that's the system and it's flawed. They don't have control over it. Then they look at this. The, the the schizophrenia that we have in with the politicians and like wait a minute we're depending on them to create more dollars you know that's not that that's not going to get us anywhere yeah. so I think that's what where we go to a central bank digital currency and the main thing there that people need to recognize is uh, why that's a big deal is because we all have an account with the Fed and therefore the Fed can better control the amount of lending. Mm-hmm. going into the real economy, therefore the amount of dollars that are being created. And if you layer UBI on top of that uh, to where they could control that with an expiration date to where they can get velocity going, yeah. then, then, then they would, now I'm not saying they could control it perfectly, but they would have a lot more control over the amount of dollars, therefore the amount of inflation. And let's all remember, they have to have the deflation to get the defla- or the inflationary deleveraging, which they would far, far prefer 
compared to a deflationary deleveraging, assuming it wasn't hyperinflation. I yep. mean, I think if you asked a central banker, you know, would you prefer kind of, uh, let's just say, five, six percent negative interest rates for the next 15 years uh, to, 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 to get that debt to GDP down uh, compared to, you know, a 1930s, they, they would go for the, uh, the, the negative real rates. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and, and that's why I think we go to that uh, central bank digital currency, because that's the only way that they can really uh, get it done. But then I think they'll they'll probably do that with the, the commercial banks. And then I think I like Russell Napier's view on it, too, where he says, OK, that's probably going to create um, certain types of lending for polit- for groups that are uh, that have political favor that right. increases prices how do they do then he's he uh, hi- his hypothesis is that they'll also come in with uh, price controls mm-hmm. like they did in the 1970s yeah. and that's kind of the mix that I see uh, as a part of our future but that you know that doesn't mean that the dollar doesn't go to 130 or 140 in the interim. Um, right. And when I mean, in, you know, the next year or two, yeah. um, it's very, very difficult to predict these things in the short term because there's so many uh, cross currents. Yeah. Um, it's just, and there's a lot of things at play here. So clearly, central banking macro is something you've been thinking about deeply for a long time. Um, I think we've thoroughly explored the many problems that the system currently has. And it seems not only is it a set of problems, but it seems to be expanding exponentially. Things There's more and more duct tape being applied to this antiquated system. The leaks are showing it in multiple ways. Um, and at the, the basis of this, in my opinion, is that, again, we have government debt as base money. We're not even using gold anymore, right? There's not even a bare asset underpinning um, the financial system for most participants, Th- then the value of base money becomes premised on the government's ability to enforce tax collections, right? That's essentially what um, what is a U.S. Treasury, right? It's debt from the government. The revenues to the government is their ability to tax or inflate the currency, essentially. So- it's also future productivity. That's from what it boils the, from, down to from future the productive, productivity. Yeah, from the from the productive economy. So my question is this if they keep we keep going down this path where governments need to inflate and tax more, right? To generate the revenues necessary to cover the promises that have been created through this debt-based system, they are and they're effectively um, suppressing the productive economy, right? Because we know mm-hmm. low and predictable taxes leads to a booming economy, and the reverse is also true. High and unpredictable taxes leads to a contraction in, in the economy. This, yeah. To my mind, this means that they need to try and exert more and more control and more and more coercion to keep the system operating are we going down a path where, and this is, I'll just throw out a, a dystopian theory that I've heard where vaccines are becoming mandated, right? That will become your vaccine passport. Your vaccine passport will become your vaccine passport app, which will become your CBDC wallet. And then they mm-hmm. control your money as a centralized utility, similar to what China is doing with a social credit score. Right. I mean, sounds maybe crazy to some people. But I would say, given the the trajectory we've witnessed over the past eighteen months with the government intervention, um, plausible, I would argue at least. And I want to I want to drill into this in the Fed thing. Like, where is your philosophical alignment against central banking in this broader uh, landscape of of dystopian possibilities? Well, I, I just think the free market would do it better. I don't think we need a central bank. I think the free banking system uh, that you and I have discussed in other conversations that we had in the 1800s, I, I don't see why that was bad. I, I think that was a great system. Uh, it wasn't perfect, obviously. Uh, there were bank failures, but uh, you know, you took your gold, you put it with the bank, they issued their own currency, uh, and there was no government intervention. There was no central bank. Uh, there were no bailouts. So people were incentivized 
to make sure that they put their money with a bank that had a good balance sheet and that mm-hmm. lended productively into society, that lended to companies that would produce stuff uh, that could therefore sell it, make a return, and and pay them back with uh, with interest. You know that's how uh, banking used to work. Believe it or not, now mm-hmm. it's uh, the banks. Uh, they don't even keep the loans on their on their books, you know. But you go down to your Wells Fargo to get a home loan, and before the ink's dry, they've already sold it to Fannie and Freddie, and they've already sold it to Wall Street, and it's already prepackaged into a mortgage-backed security, and it's most likely on the Fed's balance sheet or something, you know. Uh, so I, I, I would like to see us go back to a system like we had that was just based on uh, the free market determining what interest rates were and the individuals in the real economy just making prudent decisions on where they want to store their money or their mm. or their excess productivity. Mm. Um, you know, uh, along uh, the lines of, uh, you know, kind of what you're saying before too, going back to, um, you know, a lot of this gets very uh, complex and you really get into the, or I get into the weeds, but I think for the average person, it once, if they could just start um, looking at headlines through the lens of productivity, that, that would give them a big edge and they'd start to understand things much better. So as an example, uh, the government comes out with, uh, with UBI for a thousand dollars a month, mm-hmm. so the average Joe or Jane might sit there and scratch it. Oh, say, okay, so man, I wonder what's going to happen to the economy. I wonder what's what it's going to look like in two or three years. I wonder what this is going to do for the standard of living. You know, what are my what type of environment are my kids going to grow up? You know, mm-hmm. what all these questions that go through all of our minds. I think if you can just distill it down to asking yourself is whatever I'm reading in this headline, Mm -hmm. is it going to create a society that can create more stuff or less stuff? Right. And if the answer is less stuff, then that means that we, our society is going to be poorer. And as a result of this headline, if it's more stuff, then uh, we have the potential of being wealthier and increasing the standard of living. So I would challenge everyone to go through CNBC today, go through whatever headline you're reading on Bloomberg or whatever, and just ask yourself that simple question. And with the conclusion that you will come to, whether it's raising taxes, whether it's increasing the amount of regulation, Mm -hmm. whether it's government controlling more of where the dollars are being spent. And they're, by definition, is very uh, uh, inefficient. When you look at the job numbers and you see that the majority of the jobs, the, the quote unquote new jobs that are being created are government jobs. Okay, to ask yourself that question. You look at Elizabeth Warren wanting to spend an extra, what is it, $80 billion a year uh, to add to the budget for the IRS. Okay, mm-hmm. you may think that's a great thing. You may not. But just even if you think it's great, just ask yourself, in the future, is that going to create a society right. that is producing more or less stuff? Most likely less, <laughs> right? Absolutely. So you can go through that with pretty much with everything once you understand. And this is what's so hard for people is, is, is they just always associate uh, – dollars with wealth. Yep. And that's the big mistake uh, that they really make. And then you you combine that, I've got a couple notes written down here, with the divisiveness that we see in our political sphere. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we, uh, you know, what's amazing is every single time we get to a point where I sit there and look at a headline and say to myself, you know, what? there's George, there's no way that we could politicize anything else. We, we, we've reached our maximum. There's no way the politicians can, or, you know, the, the people on Twitter or whatever, yeah. there's no way they can politicize this there, or there's no way they, they've taken it to its extreme. We've found the, the limits of what yeah. we can politicize. Now they're politicizing inflation. Mm. <laughs> like right. what? Right. what? Like, like where, you know, where, 
what path does that take us down? And so, again, you, you just ask yourself those questions and you can see the direction that we're going. We're paying people to stay home and not produce. Yes. You know, I, I mean, you want to talk about and that that goes to a much deeper level than just goods and services. I mean, now, one thing that all the media outlets can agree on, whether it's CNN, whether it's Fox or, you know, whatever uh, propaganda you choose to listen to, uh, the one the thing they can all agree on is that the crime rates in the United States are skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Is that any surprise? Right. Is that any surprise to when we're, we're, we're pay- especially young males? And that's yeah. something that I, I think we don't talk enough about, but yeah. it really make it, it has a huge impact. You know, when I, you remember back when you were uh, at a very impressionable age, you know, say eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, and you, and, and by the way, the, let's say the divorce rates 50%, mm-hmm. which it's, it's probably higher now. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're a young uh, male like that. You're raised by a, a single mother, which it, that's, I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, good for mm-hmm. the single mom, but the fact is you don't have that strong, you know, male yes. figure most likely to look up to. Yep. Not Hold only on that, me. you go to school, yep. you go to school and 95% of your teachers are female. And again, I'm not saying that's bad. All I'm saying is that you don't have that strong male figure. Mm-hmm. And then once you get to an age where you, where I or you would have gone out and got a job and learned responsibility, mm. let's say 14, 15 years old or whatever. Now you're oh, getting gosh. UBI yeah. from, from the government and you don't have. So what happens is we create this environment where, you know, males and females, and it impacts them both negatively, yeah. but especially with males, uh, we're, we're creating this environment where they don't have any, uh, we're taking away their identity. Yeah. Right. Because with, with guys, as you know, um, you know, and I think this is I, I don't think this is a, a feature. I think this may be a bug uh, for guys, but it is what it is that, that our identity for, for a lot of us is consumed in our in our work. Yes. And, and, and what we can produce yep. and how we can provide Absolutely. for the people around us. And if you take that away. There's no I mean, purpose. No. There's no purpose. And if there's no. no purpose, I think that's when you really get the uh, the riots and the looting and everything that we've uh, seen in 2020. And I unfortunately think we will, will get worse unless we can recognize the path we're on and get off the road to serve them. Yes. Amen to that. And um, you know, they say boys too and in, in dicey situations actually go into puberty earlier. It's almost like your your um, natural response to uncertain conditions is you you tend to mature more quickly, and mm. young males, right below the, say below the age of twenty seven, I mean they're they're just crazy, right? They need to be, they need to allocate all that energy towards something productive, otherwise it tends to be destructive. And yeah, this, when you got that much testosterone, yes. just raging through your body. I mean, again, yeah. we both remember what it was like to be a a, a young, yeah. you know. 12, 13 year old kid, when you don't have any discipline, when you don't have any direction, when all you have is, is, is the government. um, And then you don't have a need to go out and learn a skill or take on that responsibility. uh, You're going to find it somewhere. Yeah. And unfortunately what we've seen is it's going to be, is it tends to be in something that, um, you know, leads towards uh, civil unrest. Yeah, agreed completely. Um, and I just like to touch on the last thing you mentioned that were again. I love this idea of money as excess productivity, and then we have UBI regulation. All government intervention is effectively negative productivity, right? They're not only right. going to pay people to stay at home, but every you know the earlier point is that the legislators' pen can never create any wealth; they can only redistribute it. So anything they're spending has been stolen from someone else, either via taxation or inflation. Yeah. And I would argue that they can't, they can't even really distribute it because they destroy it in the process right. because that would imply that if they take a hundred dollars out of the system, they're putting a hundred dollars worth of wealth back That's in. Right. And I, I don't think it, they take a hundred out and I think they're putting in two or $3. Agreed. Yes. So it's capital 
not only are you restricting capital creation by keeping people at home, but you're also inducing capital consumption and destruction. Yeah. And wealth destruction and know? wealth destruction. So then that means, you know, it's basically, and, and, and I want to also point out too, that another way that you're creating wealth destruction is because of the misallocation of resources. Yes. Yes. See, because we have no price discovery. That's right. Uh, who knows what the price of anything is when we're giving people free dollars that don't have to produce anything to get those dollars. That's right. And therefore, we are whether it's whether it's lumber, whether it's uh, you name it. Um, you know, we 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 cannot. Why did the Soviet Union crumble? Because they didn't have true free market price discovery. That's right. So the free market couldn't give those price signals to where the producers would know. Okay, I've got all these trees. I've got all this copper. Yeah. I've got all this X, Y, Z. Where should I put it? Where, where should it right. go? And prices right. are, are what directs that, that flow of traffic, yes. right? Well, if you're interrupting that flow of traffic, then your you're, you're, you're quasi-communism uh, from the standpoint of wasting so many of the valuable resources um, that that have, uh, you know, as Thomas Sowell says, scarce resources with alternative uses yes. and resources by definition are scarce. Yes. We do not have an unlimited supply of them. Right. And therefore, when we um, misallocate them, that in addition to what you're saying is making future generations uh, poor. Yes. So, <clears throat> One of the big, and I'll, I'll leave it with this, and I'll let you give me some parting words. Um, Mises makes the point, echoing what you just said, essentially, that all government action then is a misallocation of capital because mm -hmm. they are withdrawing factors from the productive economy through inflation or taxation, and they're allocating them towards some arbitrarily determined ends, which is mm -hmm. different than what the market would vote for itself. So that blew my mind. I can't stop thinking about that. And then I think, okay, how is this misallocation of capital possible? It's because of the corruption of the database that is money, right? Gold used to be this reliable database that no one could really change. It's like either you have the gold or you don't. But we introduced this layer of central banking on top of it. And now we've totally destroyed uh, the functions of money effectively to create price discovery and, and serve these other um, needs. So. I think this, that line of thinking gets me to the value proposition for Bitcoin. It's just that you have an incorruptible database and like what, when this thing blows up, because I, it seems clear to me and I think increasingly clear to most people that it's going to blow up in some way. What are our alternatives? Like, do we go back to gold or do we need, can we create a conducive global economy on an incorruptible database, something like Bitcoin? So don't mean to put it to you like that, but I wanted to plant no, the seed to think about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to what we were saying on stage at my event. And I think it depends how, how we're getting this collapse because the first and at what point, you know, is, yeah. is this tomorrow or is this in five years? Because if it's tomorrow, I would argue that we go back to gold. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to instill confidence. If the dollar, which is what usually, you know, when a country hyperinflates mm -hmm. or has a problem with their monetary system, they go, they go to the dollar because that yep. is, that's how you instill confidence. That's right. Right. But, but if the dollar is gone, then, okay, well, how are you instilling confidence? So my, again, I think if it happens tomorrow, it would be gold, but then I think, over time, we would try to figure out uh, a better system, mm -hmm. and then we could replace that gold standard, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, with a Bitcoin standard. Now, if if we fast forward ten years, and you're telling me, okay, George, now uh, Bitcoin has been adopted by fifty percent of the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, that that's a much different. That's not a much, much different uh, question, you know. Um, my my concern with both of those, though, is that at the end of the day, we're we're imperfect creatures that control uh, perfect money, uh, yeah. whether it's gold or <laughs> whether it's Bitcoin. So just like I'm talking about how, um, you know, we've got the collateral multiplier. Yeah, I think that I think it would be much better 
you know, and I, I understand the value proper prop, uh, proposition, especially with Bitcoin, yeah. how it would be decentralized uh, to such a, a, a significant degree above and beyond gold. But I think at some point it, we forget about the lessons of history. Mm. You know, I'm talking 30, 40 years down the road mm. here. And, and, and we start getting the collateral multipliers again and the derivatives and the this and the that. Mm. And um, hopefully, hopefully we don't, but, uh, but we'll see, we'll see it, how it all plays out because, you know, the one thing we all agree on is that the, the system that we have right now is broken. Yes. And it, it is, it is being put together right now with spit, and, and duct tape. Yeah. And uh, it, can that go on another five years, 10 years, 50 years? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But the system is highly unstable and it is not functioning properly. That's for sure. Certainly. And it, yeah, this just tons and tons of deferred settlement, right? And we don't have enough final settlement. And that, I think that's the hope for Bitcoin is you can have this final settlement system that cuts through a lot of this bullshit that we've seen build up in the, the existing system in the form of deferred settlement. So I can talk to you for hours about this. You know, George, you're the man. I love the way you put it out. <laughs> Simply, you've got a very strong message. A lot of people resonate with it. So I thank you for all that you do. Um, please tell my audience where they can find you. You can just look up my name, George Gammon. It's G-A-M-M-O-N on youtube or twitter whatever and you'll uh, all my stuff will pop up my website my social media everything and i sincerely appreciate you having me on the show i always cherish the time that we have together and uh, our talks uh, are always very memorable and i can't wait to do it again of course man and then you're doing the rebel capitalist event again next year or what's the plan of that i am yeah yeah awesome. january 7th through the 9th in houston um i have really wanted ron paul to be there because he's one of my my heroes <laughs> and uh his team said that he, he really doesn't like to fly because he's not like dealing with tsa uh, so i said okay what if i do the event in houston so he can just drive there what would that would that give me a uh, a green light and they said yeah if you do it in houston he'll, he'll, he'll be there so awesome. uh that's why the event is in houston just fyi but we've got ron paul and uh you know other great people that we had at the last event uh and then we've got g edward griffin who oh, wrote nice. the creature from jekyll island yeah, yeah. uh he's going to be there and it's all at uh, rebel capitalist live if people want to check it out rebelcapitalistlive.com yeah awesome well george thank you thank you again so much